Now, you remember the man with the withered hand. Remember him from, from Sunday? We had a look at the parallel between Jeroboam, who in his days, everything went back to Egypt. They'd returned to Egypt in their hearts. We saw the number of connections with Egypt in the reigns of Solomon, Rehoboam, and Jeroboam. And his hand, as a sign, was withered or dried up, which was a, a symbol of the, the power that had been dried up by God. And similarly, in the New Testament, we have the man with the withered hand, who is a symbol of the state of Israel at that point. And we had a look at the record of that miracle, both in Matthew's record and in Luke's record. Well, let's have a look at Mark's record. If you want to open your Bibles at Mark chapter 3. Mark's an interesting gospel record. I actually almost went down this route uh, for the entire series because Mark is an exposition of the new exodus of Israel. The first half of Mark is full of miracles, which are obviously are typical in the, the, uh, the mission of our Lord Jesus, but there is an abundance of miracles, especially demon miracles, in the first half of Mark. And what Mark is illustrating is Jesus taking Israel out of Egypt once again in another exodus, that they have become possessed with the spirit of Egypt once again. And the casting out of demons and the other miracles that he performs are all a parable of taking them out of Egypt, of defeating the gods of Egypt once again. And then in the second half of Mark, we get this continual phrase that they followed Jesus in the way. And now he leads his people in the way of the wilderness towards life. That, that, in a nutshell, is what the gospel record of Mark is all about. So within that context, brothers and sisters, have a look at the language that Mark has here in this same miracle of the healing of a man with a withered hand, the dried up hand. This man who represents the nation of Israel. And the language here, you'll see, echoes with the Exodus. So Mark chapter 3, verse 1 Again, Jesus entered the synagogue, the, the arena of the false religion of the Jews. And a man was there with a withered hand, and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them, and here's the key verse, brothers and sisters. He looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. And then he performs the miracle and, and heals this man. He was grieved at their hardness of heart. Now, yesterday we had a look at the hardness of Pharaoh's heart and the hardness of the hearts of the Egyptians. We ask the question, well, what about the children of Israel? Were they any better? There's the bad example of Pharaoh, a hard-hearted, stubborn man. What about the people of God? Were they any better? Well, in New Testament times here, we see the spirit of Pharaoh, the spirit of Egypt, in the children of Israel. He was grieved at the hardness of their heart. And uh, as we saw on Sunday, in the context, we get this debate between Jesus and the equivalent of the magicians of Egypt, the scribes and the Pharisees, where they, they accuse him of casting out demons by Beelzebub. And that's in a uh, little, little later on in this chapter from verse 22 down to about verse 27. And then Jesus follows that up in verses 28 to 30 by saying, this attitude of mind of the Jews was blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. The unforgivable sin. This is another of one of those questions we ask, like, was Pharaoh's hard heart something that prevented his free will, the hardening of his heart? Another question we often have is, what is this unforgivable sin? What is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Well, it's connected, brothers and sisters, with the hardness of their hearts and the attitude of mind that they had. They've, they've gone back to Egypt in their hearts just as the children of Israel did when they've come out of Egypt, they've seen all these signs and wonders, 
and they keep going back to Egypt in their hearts. And we see this from over and over and over again with the generation in the wilderness. And as Hebrews records in Hebrews chapter 3, that whole generation died in the wilderness. And Hebrews sums it up. It was because of unbelief. They couldn't enter into the promised land. And that generation, apart from Caleb and Joshua, were guilty of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So let's have a little look at what this, this means. Um, back in, again, in verse 5, the language again, Jesus was grieved at their hardness of heart. Now that same language is used by the Apostle Paul. If you want to turn with me to Ephesians and chapter 4, that phrase, the hardness of heart, that, that word hardness is only used in two other places in the entire New Testament. One of them is in Romans chapter 11, where Paul talks about the, in the King James, it says the blindness, but it's the same word, the hardness of the hearts of Israel. And he uses the same word now in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 17, it says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. And he uses language here that describes the Gentiles just like the Egyptians, futile in their thinking. Verse 18, darkened in their understanding. Egypt was a place of spiritual darkness, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. I think in the King James it says blindness, but it's the same word that's used in, in Mark's gospel. It was due to the hardness of their hearts. So that's Egypt. That's the Gentiles. They're ignorant. They're in darkness. They're hard-hearted. They're stubborn. The, the Word of God cannot penetrate that hard heart. He says in verse 19, they have become callous and given themselves up to sensuality. Notice that language there, brothers and sisters. They have given themselves up to sensuality. We're going to see that this language here, which is about the, the dark, ignorant Gentile world, akin to Egypt, is exactly the same language used of the generation of the children of Israel, God's people who came out of Egypt. Given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, to practice every kind of impurity, but that is not the way you learn Christ. And what he goes on to say there in verses 22 to 24 is the, the theological lesson that comes out of coming out of Egypt and then going into the promised land. It's putting off the old man and putting on the new man. That's what, what it means to, to come out of Egypt, to put to death self, as our brother Nathan has been talking about, to put away that thinking of the flesh of the old man, and then to have that new mind of the spirit, which is connected with the things of God. So Paul here is bringing out the whole lesson of the Exodus, that very, very simple lesson for us. And then in the, the next few verses, he talks about what it means to have a spiritual mind. What is this new man? And he gives several examples of what that new man is. And one of them is in verse 30. One example of the mind of the Spirit is in verse 30 of the same chapter, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. That word grieve there, exactly the same word. This is what Jesus experienced when he encountered these hard-hearted Jews. He was grieved at their hardness of heart. So what does it mean then to grieve the Holy Spirit of God? Well, if you have a good margin, it will tell you that that's actually a quotation from Isaiah. Does anyone see that in their margin against verse 30? To grieve the Holy Spirit of God? You'll notice that that is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 63, which, by the way, is in this whole section in the second half of Isaiah which is all about the second exodus of Israel. They are going to go into captivity again. 
into Babylon later on. And Isaiah's exhortation is about coming out of Babylon just as they came out of Egypt. And so there is echo after echo with the time of the Exodus in, his, in Isaiah, such as in Isaiah 63, where we're reminded of that angel that went in the way before the children of Israel as God led them through the wilderness. And you'll see the language of Ephesians chapter 4 here. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up, carried them all the days of old. But that generation who experienced the love and the care of God rebelled. And here it is, they grieved his Holy Spirit. And that was the experience then of Jesus as he attempts to take his people again on another exodus. They have returned again to Egypt. And they grieved his Holy Spirit. Another passage we could turn to is uh, Psalm 78. This is uh, a parallel. This puts the, the same uh, language of I Isaiah into slightly different words. It says, how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Jesus is experiencing that same emotion of the people of his day. They tested God day uh, again and again. This is talking about that generation who grumbled and complained despite all these signs that had been shown to them. Evidence of the power of God. And that negative attitude reappears again when they, they, say, they, they see the power of God again in Jesus casting out demons. And they say, this is the work of Beelzebub. So they tested God again and again, provoked the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember His power. This is what blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is, I believe, brothers and sisters. They did not remember His power or the day when He redeemed them from the foe when he performed his signs in Egypt, his marvels in the field of Zoan, and then it goes on to, to list the manifestations of that power in the form of the, the plagues upon Egypt. So what was their problem then, brothers and sisters? Let's, let's try to dissect exactly what was the problem that that people had who came out of Egypt. And it's sometimes difficult to fathom, isn't it, brothers and sisters? They see... Evidence after evidence after evidence of the power of Yahweh. Ten plagues. The Red Sea, passing through the Red Sea, the, de the demolishing of Egypt. Bread comes down from heaven, water from the rock. The angel of God's presence leading them through the wilderness. And yet, that same generation hardened their hearts. And because of unbelief, they all died in the wilderness. It's incredible when we think about it. So let's try to think about exactly what was wrong with them. Now, to summarize the problem here, brothers and sisters, we know that uh, man is made in the image and likeness of God. The problem with the Israelites is that they were more in the image and likeness of Pharaoh. They had the spirit of Pharaoh, hard-hearted, just like him. They were more like Pharaoh than like God. Now, with that in mind, come back with me to Exodus in chapter 9. And I just want to point something out to you that our sister Susanna pointed out to me after my class yesterday. And she said, have a look at this. Look at what it says in the margin here. And it just pops out of you. Like, wow, that, that's incredible. So, this is the chapter 9 and the plague of hail that we looked at yesterday. And you remember what happened in the plague of hail. This is the personal plague for Pharaoh. For, for, <laughs> for Pharaoh. And this is the plague in which God shows his supreme power that he can penetrate that hard heart of Pharaoh. He got through to him. But we saw the sad end of the story, didn't we? That, that for a moment, Pharaoh acknowledges his sin. And the righteousness of God. But then moments later, despite this experience he's gone through, he hardens his heart again and he does not let the people go. 
Now, in the middle of that context, brothers and sisters, have a look at this in Exodus 9, verse 27. Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, This time I have sinned. Yahweh is righteous. I and my people are wrong. Plead. Now, look what he says then in verse 28. See if there's a Bible echo here and have a look at your margin. Verse 28. Plead with Yahweh, for there has been enough mighty thundering in the King James, I think it says, and hail. There has been enough mighty thundering. Now, what does it say in your margin? The voice of God. He had had enough of the voice of God. In fact, that word mighty there in the Hebrew is the word Elohim, God. The word thunderings there is the word for voice. Now, what does that remind you of? Great displays of power that he's experienced. There's thundering and lightning. And he says, I don't want to hear the voice of God. What's that a foreshadowing of? Who else experienced that? And then hardened their hearts. That's exactly Israelites at Sinai. This is a foreshadowing of Israel. And what the Spirit here is doing, I believe, brothers and sisters, is showing this parallel between Pharaoh and Israel. Israel were more like Pharaoh than they were like God. Now, with that in mind, remember God's initial promise. Here, here, brothers and sisters, is the main exhortation. What is God attempting to do with the children of Israel and with the Egyptians as he pours out these plagues upon Egypt, this, these great displays of power, what was he attempting to do? Well, we get the, the lesson, what God was trying to do in Exodus chapter 15. We had a look at this earlier this week. The very first thing God does for them, as they come out of the wilderness, they've gone through all of this experience, these great displays of power, they're now on the other side of the uh, the Red Sea, and God makes a statute and a rule and saying, what I really want is for you to listen to my voice. Listen to the voice of Yahweh your God and do that which is right in his eyes. That's it. That's, that's the fundamental lesson, brothers and sisters. What God was trying to do with the plagues and all these other miracles was simply to grab their attention. So they might pause and listen to the voice of God. And that, of course, is the problem with Pharaoh. He says, despite seeing these great miracles, he doesn't want to listen to the voice of God. And it was exactly the same problem with the children of Israel. Now come with me to Psalm 95, which summarizes the problem this is a, a psalm which is quoted in Hebrews chapter 3, That's, that chapter which says that the children of Israel died in the wilderness because of their unbelief. Because despite seeing this evidence of the power of God, they blasphemed the Holy Spirit, they grieved the Spirit of God, and they died in the wilderness. You see, if we don't listen... If we don't let the Word of God penetrate our heart, then, brothers and sisters, we shall die in the wilderness too. That is something which is unforgivable. So, Psalm 95, just look at how this summarizes everything we've been talking about this week. In verse 3, what God was trying to tell the Egyptians and Israel is that Yahweh is a great God and a great King above all gods. That's the lesson of the plagues, isn't it, brothers and sisters? In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his. He made it. His hands form the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before Yahweh, our maker. This is the creator God who created 
the lice, who created the frog, who created the Nile, who created the hail, who created all of these things. He, all things are in his power, and he is sovereign over all. That's the education experience for everyone in the, the plagues. And so it says then, what is the lesson that God wants us to learn then at the end of verse 7? Today, if you hear his voice. And ultimately, brothers and sisters, it wasn't about the power, was it? What God wanted them to appreciate was not the outward manifestation of that power in and of itself, but what was the, the invisible spirit behind that power, the voice of God. Same lesson that Elijah learned on Mount Sinai. It's not about the earthquake, the wind and the fire, but that still small voice. So the end of verse 7 says, Today, if you hear his voice, that's what I want. Verse 8, do not harden your hearts like you did at Meribah on the day of Massah in the wilderness, those times when they grumbled and, and complained. We have no water, we have no food. When your fathers, verse 9, put me to the test, Put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. See the point? They had seen God's work. They'd seen evidence of God's handiwork. But they blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Verse 10, for 40 years I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Now have a look at the the contrast there between verses 9 and 10. It says in verse 9, they have seen my work. And then in verse 10 it says, but they have not known my ways. And that's the problem of, of the Jews throughout history, brothers and sisters, and it can be a problem for us too, that we focus so much on the tangible things, the things that we can see and touch and handle. But we miss the, the ways, the invisible ways of God that are, that are behind those things. That was the problem with Judaism in the first century. They were focused on the tangible things, things that could be touched and observed and quantified and measured. And they missed the weightier matters of the law, of things like justice and truth and righteousness. That was the same problem with Israel in the wilderness. Now, think back to the Egyptians who responded to that seventh plague of hail. Remember yesterday we saw that this was a unique plague in that God gave opportunity for the Egyptians to escape the plague. You remember that? Where, where God says, I'm going to bring this plague, you better take your livestock inside and stay inside until the end of this plague. And it says that some of the Egyptians feared. Now what did they fear? You might think, well, they feared the prospect of another plague. They've just gone through six awful experiences, displays of the power of God. But what does it say of the Egyptians? What did they fear? Anyone remember? They feared the Word of God. That's what they feared. And that's what God is looking for, brothers and sisters. Not fear of the power, but fear of reverence, respect for the word. So the Egyptians show the right attitude here. Now there's a, a couple of passages which really connect with that. Here in Exodus chapter 33, in the context of what we're going to look at in a moment, uh, the, I mean the making of the golden calf, in Exodus chapter 33, which follows on from that, Moses you remember, goes down into the valley. He's received the Ten Commandments and the pattern of the tabernacle. He goes down into the valley. The people are worshipping this golden calf. He goes back up. And there's something missing. And this is where God, uh, Moses has this conversation with God and says, Please show me your glory. What am I missing here? He says, Now therefore, if I found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways. We've seen your acts. We've seen these displays of power. 
What are we missing? Show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Show me your glory. And what God showed to Moses was invisible, intangible, unquantifiable, immeasurable. I will make all my goodness pass before you. And then the extension of that in the next chapter where the fullness of God's glory is shown to Moses. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, and, and so forth. These invisible attributes of Yahweh. That is what it is all about. That's the true power that's expressed in the Word of God, in the voice of God. That's what God wants us to respond to. It's not about the power the outward manifestation of the power, it's about the inward mind of God, the, the things that Nathan has been talking about in his classes. And uh, in Psalm 103, I think this neatly summarizes the difference between Moses and the children of Israel. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. So the question for us then, brothers and sisters, is this. We have evidence, too, of the power of God. We're going to talk about uh, this in a moment when we go to uh, Romans chapter 1. We have evidence of the power of God. What do we do with that evidence? We have a choice. We can stay in the valley below and worship a golden calf, or we can ascend with Moses up into the mount of God and see his ways. That's the choice, then, that's before us. But before we get to that, let's come back to the attitude of mind of the Israelites who went into the wilderness. Come back with me to Exodus to chapter 6. Now this is before the plagues are poured out. God sends Moses to Israel with a message. Here is the voice of God for Israel. And you remember previously, Moses has had a previous manifestation of, of God's glory at the burning bush, where he says, what is your name? And you remember the answer, I will be who I will be. That, that enigmatic name, what does that mean? I will be who I will be. What will God be? Well, the answer is found here in Exodus chapter 6. Here we have God himself explaining what he will be. And it's a wonderfully positive message. So let's go in here in uh, chapter 6 and verse 5. God says to Moses, Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am Yahweh. Well, what does that mean? What follows then in the next few verses is a, is a series of I will statements. What will God be? Well, I will, verse 6, bring them out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know, same education as the plagues, that I am Yahweh, your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am Yahweh. What a message. I will ease your burden. I'll take you from out out from the burdens of the Egyptians. I'll take you out of Egypt. I'll adopt you as my people, and I will bring you into the promised land. What could be more wonderful than that, brothers and sisters? That's everything. And yet look at the response of this generation of people. Verse 9. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen. They didn't listen. And again, you scratch your head and think, well, how do you fathom that? I'm going to 
do everything for you. There's nothing negative in this. And they didn't listen. What's going on here? And this is the spirit, brothers and sisters, that went with the children of Israel throughout their whole wandering in the wilderness. They simply didn't listen. And we are Israel, brothers and sisters. We're no different. We have to learn the lesson to open our ears to the voice of God. Now, it says at the end of verse 9 there, the reasons why they didn't listen, and I think this is very enlightening for us. It says, it gives two reasons at the end of verse 9. They didn't listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So let's focus in then on this, this language here. These two reasons, their broken spirit and harsh slavery. Now, when you see the phrase broken spirit, we might think, well, that's connected with what Jesus says in the New Testament, that we need to be poor of spirit. Or David in Psalm 51, he talks about having a broken spirit. We might think that that's a good attitude of mind, that they were humble. That's not what that phrase means at all, though, brothers and sisters. That, that word broken there is the opposite of the word that Nathan talked about yesterday in his class. Remember long-suffering? What did long-suffering literally mean? Long-nosed. Remember that? And the, the idea of patience, where you take a deep breath and pause before responding. Well, that is the exact opposite. The literal meaning of that word broken there is shortness. Shortness. It implies the idea of impatience and things like despondency and discouragement and bitterness. That was the spirit, brothers and sisters, of the children of Israel in the wilderness. They had, as it were, let Egypt eat away at them and affect them negatively. And that's a spirit we can all get into sometimes, brothers and sisters. We're all guilty of this from time to time. We let the world get to us. And, and the situations we find ourselves in life. And instead of relying on the, the glory of God, we choose the, the bitterness and the despondency of the, the world affect us. Now, this spirit went with Israel all the way through their 40 years of wandering. Let's go to Numbers chapter 21, and this concerns Israel now. This is not the generation that came out of Egypt. This is now the new generation. So we often think about the, the big contrast between those who came out of Egypt and those who went into the promised land, but they had very, very similar problems. This is the story of human nature. And in Numbers chapter 21, they're on their final advance to the promised land. They can almost see the promised land across the river Jordan. And I, I think this is a wonderful story in Numbers chapter 21, which is like a, a miniature summary of the Exodus that they're now going to experience. And it starts off extremely positive. Now, as we read this, brothers and sisters, just think, does this ever happen in my life? What happens at the beginning in Numbers chapter 21 is that they encounter one of those big situations in life, a big trial. It says that the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, that's the south, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Atharim. He fought against Israel and took some of them captive. And Israel vowed a vow to God and said, If you will indeed give this people into my hand, then I will devote their cities to destruction. So Israel responds in faith here to this trial. They make a covenant with God. If you look after us, we will devote ourselves to you. God, verse 3, showing the example he wants of his people. What did he do? He listened, verse 3. He heeded the voice of Israel. So God does it and gave over the Canaanites, and they respond in kind. They keep their side of the covenant. They devoted them and their cities to destruction, so the name of the place was called Horma. Now, sometimes in life, brothers and sisters, we find ourselves facing a giant like David, and we respond in faith, and we come through that trial victorious, a triumph of faith. 
And then we go back to the drudgery of daily life. And look what happens in the very next verse, verse 4. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient. Same word as we have in Exodus chapter 6. Same spirit. The people became impatient. They're not facing Canaanites now. They're not facing giants. They're just normal daily routine of life. They became impatient. And it says there in verse 5, they spoke against Mo God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. We loathe this worthless bread. Do you ever fall into that, brothers and sisters, where you, you, you face the great trial, a giant in life, and you've got through it, and everything's wonderful and victorious, and then you go back to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, just the drudgery of daily life, the routine. And that's why you start to grumble and complain about your lot in life. That's human nature. And that's what the children of Israel fell into. It is so very easy, brothers and sisters, to, to lapse into that kind of impatient attitude that leads to discouragement, despondency, and a, a bitter spirit. It is the, the carnal mind, brothers and sisters, to a T. Now, the other part of this, apart from their, their shortness, their impatience, was this harsh slavery. Harsh slavery. So, again, they had let their experiences in Egypt get to them, eat away at them, affect them. Now, that word harsh is really, really interesting. It is a synonym for being hard-hearted. It's used to describe Pharaoh... Um, in one passage, and it's a word that is, becomes a word that is emblematic of what Israel were like, that the harsh slavery they endured was internalized in their psyche so that they became harsh in and of themselves. And uh, a good lexicon will tell you that this is a rather interesting word. It comes from the root kasar, this word harsh, which, as this lexicon says, apparently arose from an agricultural milieu. So many, most Hebrew words have a very concrete meaning behind them. And this is uh, the case with this word. When we think of a harsh spirit, think of a stubborn ox. This is what this lexi lexicon is going to say. It emphasizes first the subjective effect exerted by an overly heavy yoke. It's the same word that's used in the story of Rehoboam when they came and said, please ease our burden and, and the, the yoke that was put upon their shoulders. So this is what the children of Israel are feeling like in Egypt. They felt the weight of the yoke of the burdens of the Egyptians upon their shoulders. A yoke which is hard to bear and secondarily the rebellious resistance of oxen to the yoke. And for synonym, see kabed, which is that word for the hardness of heart. So that's the imagery that we're meant to see when it comes to the attitude of mind of the children of Israel. They were like a stubborn ox. A number of passages, the, the middle section there, a number of passages use the metaphor of a yoke which is hard to bear. And the example there is used of the servitude in Egypt. So in Exodus chapter 1, verse 14, when it talks about Israel, being under the taskmasters, the burdens of the Egyptians, it uses that same word. And so sometimes we can be like that, brothers and sisters, letting the world affect us and becoming hard-hearted as a result of how the world shapes us. And then this is an interesting comment. This is what we're going to get into now. A frequent use of the word relates to the stubborn or stiff-necked Subjects of the Lord, like rebellious, oxen, calf-worshipping Israel. And here then, brothers and sisters, is the irony of the whole wilderness generation. We recognize this word. We know that a number of times Israel were called in the wilderness stiff-necked. Let's have a look at a, a, an occurrence of this in Exodus chapter 32. So here is this new generation now. 
or this old generation rather, who have come out of Egypt. And in Exodus chapter 32, Moses has gone up into the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, which are now going to bring order to this, this new people. And as Moses is up in the mountain, chapter 32, we have the incident of the golden calf. And in verse 9, Yahweh said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. That's this word that we're looking at, a stiff-necked people. And that is repeated. Twice they're called that in chapter 33. Again, they're called that in chapter 34. This is the defining characteristic of this people. They are like a stubborn ox. And so the irony here is that they make an image of a golden calf, which as we'll see in, in the Psalms later on, is defined there as an ox that eats grass. In other words, they made an image of exactly what they were like. They weren't in the image and likeness of God. They were in the image and likeness of a stubborn ox. So Aaron makes the golden calf. And have you ever looked at this and think, what on earth was going through the mind of Aaron? And what was he thinking? He's, he's been Moses' right-hand man through all the ten plagues. He's the one who, who stretched out his rod and performed these miracles. He's seen them right there. And he's the one who makes the golden calf, for crying out loud. I mean, it defies belief, doesn't it, brothers and sisters? But this is what we're like. So let's analyze the context here. So the verse in question we want to focus in on is, is chapter 32 here and verse 4, which says that he received the gold from their hand. So they, they, he gathers together the gold that they've taken out of Egypt, and he melts it all down. And it says there in verse 4, he fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I mean, they, they, it's, it's ridiculous. Everything in this story, brothers and sisters, shows that Israel now has returned to Egypt. They came out of Egypt physically, but they are still possessed with the demon of Egypt. Now, the juxtaposition of chapter 32 with what happens before is really rather interesting. Notice the contrast here with what we read about just before this is all recorded for us. So, in chapter 31, the beginning of this chapter, Moses has been given the pattern of the tabernacle, and it, the, the section finishes with these builders who are now going to be given the power of God to build God's house. They're given spirit gifts, the spirit of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. They're, they're given, as it were, the spirit mind to take these raw materials and turn them into the house of God. And there's a, there's a wonderful lesson for us there, brothers and sisters, because these are materials that normally in Egypt would have been used to make idols, gold, silver, bronze. And the question for us is, what do we do with our raw materials, our resources, our time, our abilities? What are we building? Are we building the house of God using that spiritual mind? Or do we make a golden calf? It's the same raw material. What are we making out of that raw material? So there's the contrast then. Building the house of God, Aaron, meanwhile, is building a graven image. And at the end of chapter 31, we get a reminder of the Sabbath. We looked at this earlier, how the Sabbath is a lesson about the, the sovereignty of God, that in, in six days He made the heavens and earth. And the whole building of the tabernacle is a, is a parable of God's purpose in creation. And finally, that tabernacle is full of the glory of God, just as God's purpose is to fill this earth with His glory. And so they're reminded at the end of chapter 31, this is the work of God. He is sovereign over all things. He is the, the fashioner of the universe. And it's in that context that Aaron fashions a golden calf. 
And then look at the very last verse of chapter 31. Just before we read about what the children of Israel are doing in the valley, it says in verse 31, He gave to Moses, when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. So everything here in the context, brothers and sisters, is about the work of God. His power given to the builders of the, His house. His sovereignty in the, in the Sabbath law. And His finger writing on those tablets of stone. And so now we get this contrast with what Aaron is doing, making a golden calf, as we've seen there in verse 4, fashioning it in a different kind of creation. This is now the work of the flesh, fashioning it with a graving tool. Now that's really rather interesting. That word uh, graving tool there that Aaron uses is this word down here, charet. Charet, however you pronounce that. Now you'll notice the letters here, these three letters that form this word, also form this word chatom, which is the Hebrew word for magicians. And these are the only two words in the entire Bible that come from this particular root. There is a connection then between the magicians of Egypt, the priests of Egypt, and now this high priest elect of God who chooses rather to use an implement that would have been used by these equivalent of the scribes of Israel who were the ones who would have used something like a grieving tool. The only other time this word is used is in Isaiah 8 verse 2 where it is translated as an iron pen. They would have used this sort of implement, the magicians of Egypt, to, in their tablets of stone, inscribe Egyptian holy writ. And here is Aaron using an implement of the priests of Egypt to fashion a golden calf. The irony is, is biting, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Everything then to do with this is going back to Egypt. He's acting more like a priest of Egypt than a priest of God. Uh, Metalworking, brothers and sisters, was very advanced in ancient Egypt. These are some of the, the tools, the graving tools that have been found in e Egyptian archaeological digs. The methods of metalworking, melting, forging, soldering, and the chasing of metal were not only much practiced, but also most highly developed. The frequent references of metalworking in ancient Egypt give us a truer conception of the importance of this industry in ancient Egypt. They were experts at metalworking. They could take gold, brothers and sisters, and produce gold and thread that they would embroider with. They were very, very advanced in metalworking. They were experts at making idols. And here is Aaron. He hasn't learned this from God. He's learned this from Egypt, hasn't he? He's taken the skills of Egypt, the metalworking of Egypt, to make a golden calf. Now, there's something more to this. Why a golden calf? Now, strictly speaking, this golden calf, brothers and sisters, is not a replacement for Yahweh. Remember that Aaron subsequently says, tomorrow is a feast to Yahweh. So they're not really replacing Yahweh. Who are they replacing? Who's gone up into the mountain? And we say, we don't know what's become of him. They, they want, they're replacing Moses. They need a tangible mediator. And they've lost sight of Moses. And this is a people who struggle to see the invisible. All they see are the outward manifestations of power. They've seen all these miracles, but they do not know God's ways. They struggle to see the invisible. So when Moses disappears, they need something that they can see and handle. This is the same religion as the Jews in the first century. The tangible, quantifiable religion of the flesh. Now, the Egyptians did have such a God who was a mediator between man and the greater gods. And this particular God was a 
bull god called Apis. And they have dug up golden calves or bulls, cows, all sorts of things in Egypt, idols. This is probably something like what Aaron made, although I believe actually what he really made was um, a mask. There's a suggestion in the Hebrew that he really made a golden mask that looked like a, a cow. And in their rituals, the Egyptians used to wear masks of bulls and cows, and uh, they would dance around and do all their, their funky stuff. So they found golden calves in archaeological digs in Egypt, and uh, they actually always had, in, their, uh, in the cult of Apis, they actually had a real live bull that represented this god. And that god was so important to them that when that, that bull died, they mummified the bull. And they found these tombs. This is a 60-ton tomb, and inside it they found the mummified remains of a bull. So this was a, this was a huge cult in Egypt. That was Apis, and he was, as I said, a mediator god. So, like Moses was a mediator, and he was in particular a mediator to this fellow called Ptah. And Ptah was the god who the Egyptians said fashioned the universe. So here in chapter 31, we talk, we, we've talked about the fashioner of, the real fashioner of the universe, who made heaven and earth in six days. And here they are worshipping the fashioner of the universe according to Egyptian mythology. He was the god of craftsmen and builders. Yahweh has just given the spirit to the craftsmen and builders of his house. He's particularly associated with sculpture and metalworking. Aaron seems fully involved in this cult. And there were tools that were used in his ceremony, such as uh, graving tools. So... Everything here, brothers and sisters, points to Aaron going back in his heart to Egypt, using Egyptian knowledge, using Egyptian skills, using Egyptian philosophy, however you want to call it. That is what has possessed this, this generation. Now let's have a look in Psalm 106 before we draw things to a close with a couple more passages. Psalm 106 and verse 19. This is the divine commentary on what happened in Exodus chapter 32 and all the other examples of the children of Israel and the hardness of their heart. Look what it says here in Psalm 106. And we'll go in here at verse 19. It says, they made a calf in Horeb, what we just read about, and worshipped a metal image. They, and this is the, the, the verse we want to focus in on here, brothers and sisters, they exchanged the glory of God for an image of an ox that eats grass. And that's the ridiculousness of, of the whole thing. Who, in their right mind, would exchange the glory of God for an ox that eats grass. But that's exactly what they did, and that's exactly, brothers and sisters, how we can be if we fall into the same spirit. They exchanged that invisible spirit of God, that glory of God which Moses is about to see on the mountain, the, the wonderful character, characteristics, the unquantifiable, invisible attributes of God, they exchanged that for an ox that eats grass. They prefer to be everything that that ox represents under the yoke, under the burdens of the Egyptians. That's what they wanted. They didn't want to leave Egypt. And that is evident all the way through their wilderness wanderings. They cried to, to heaven to be released from their bondage. And what they really wanted, and just think how this might apply to you sometimes, brothers and sisters. They wanted... God to ease their burden, but not then go and leave Egypt. You ever feel like that, brothers and sisters? You, you want God to make your life easier, but you don't actually want to leave Egypt and go into the wilderness of life, away from the trappings of Egypt. Egypt. 
away from the onions and the garlics and the leeks and all the wonderful things of Egypt. We just want our lives to be a little bit easier. That's the spirit of this generation. And so they exchange the invisible qualities of God, which are, are much harder to develop and live by. What's easier, to, to live by a religion in which you can quantify things, when everything's in a neat box, when you're like an ox in a field, you know where the boundaries of the field are, everything's tangible. That's an easy religion, and that's what we naturally want, brothers and sisters. And that was the religion of the Egyptians. Everything was, was tangible, was seeable and touchable with all of their idols. And yet what God is looking for is something far more meaningful, but which is invisible, the qualities of His character. So it says in Romans chapter 8, and, and, and Romans chapter 8, which is a wonderful chapter to sum up all that we've, all three speakers have said. I know John is going to talk about Romans chapter 8 in his class. Uh, Nathan touched on it in his, his last class. Uh, and Romans chapter 8, it says around about verse 14 or 15, Paul says, we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So the question for us, brothers and sisters, is in all the various tangible things of our religion, whether it be our daily Bible readings or going to meeting on Sunday or whatever it might be that we do which we can see and touch and handle, do we, brothers and sisters, see the invisible spirit behind those things? That is the fundamental question. Are we truly listening for the voice of God? Well, let's sum this up with a one couple uh, last passages. Romans chapter 1. We'll just go through this very quickly. Romans chapter 1. And we're going to borrow the 10 minutes that we finished early on yesterday. Romans chapter 1, verse 19. See how this matches the, the whole exhortation that we've been looking at this week, brothers and sisters. Verse 19 says, For what can be known about God? That's what God was trying to do with the plagues that they might know that I am Yahweh. What could be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, those invisible qualities of God, which is the spirit behind what He was doing, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. And brothers and sisters, we are without excuse. If we cannot see the invisible things behind what God does in our lives, then we have missed the entire point. Verse 21, For although they knew God, in a sense, they did not honor Him as God, or give thanks to Him, but they were, became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were darkened. We, we read this about the Gentiles in Ephesians chapter 4, the same language. Verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools. And here it is, Psalm 106, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. There it is again. We prefer to have a tangible, quantifiable religion than the weightier matters of the law. Invisible things like truth and justice and kindness and patience. For this reason, God gave them up. Verse 26. Verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind. Just like the Gentiles, just like the Egyptians, just like the generation in the wilderness, God gave them up to what they truly wanted. And when they asked for flesh, God says, 
I'll give you what you want, and you hopefully will learn the lesson. And he gave them flesh to eat, and they died. So let's finish, brothers and sisters, in another psalm, Psalm 81. And we'll let the inspired writer of this psalm summarize things for us much better than I could. This is a psalm all about that wilderness generation. It says in verse 1 of Psalm 81, it starts off in this very positive light. Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Raise a song. Sound the tra- tambourine. The sweet lyre with a harp. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon on our feast day. For it is a statute for Israel, a rule of the God of Jacob. He made it a decree in Joseph when he went out over the land of Egypt. And our minds there in, in, in the sound of the tambourine go to Mir- Miriam and the women on the banks of the Red Sea. Egypt has been destroyed. And they've been adopted as God's people. Verse 5. Sorry, verse 6. I relieved your shoulder of the burden. God took away that yoke. He took away the yoke. But the problem we have, brothers and sisters, is that when we leave our comfort zone, we we have a lot of problems with that, don't we? We we don't really want to leave Egypt because it's uncomfortable to leave the, um, the things that we're used to into that wilderness of life. And so we go back to Egypt in our hearts. But God relieves our shoulder of the burden. He makes us free. We're not an ox contained in a, in a, in a pen. We're, we're an eagle, free in the, in the air. Which would you rather be? Your hands were freed from the basket at the end of verse 6. And that's a reference to the baskets they carried and they collected straw in. In distress, verse 7, you called... And I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. God listened. I tested you at the waters of Meribah, where they hardened their hearts. And so verse 8 says, Hear, O my people, while I admonish you, O Israel, if you would but listen to me. That's all God wants. He just wants us to listen. Verse 9, there shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. But, verse 11, my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over. There's the language of Romans 1. I gave them over to their stubborn, hard, ox-like hearts to follow their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and, and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate Yahweh would cringe toward him and their fate would last forever. But he would feed you with the finest of the wheat and with honey from the rock. I would satisfy you. Brothers and sisters, that's what God wants to do for us. Why do we cling to the gods of Egypt who might satisfy us in the short term? Yeah, sure. But God is willing to satisfy us for eternity.